Hello everyone, I hope you are doing well. So in today's video, we'll be going through the 2018 Northern Hemisphere uh, Physics Exam Short Answer Questions Part 2, where we'll be pretty much going through questions 10 to 18. Like always guys, before I start this video, if you guys want private tutor in specialist methods, physics or chemistry, you can always email me through this email. And yeah guys, let's smash through this video. Alright. Question 10. Two VCE physics students, Laura and Hal, are investigating Snell's law. They set up their apparatus to measure the refraction of a beam of red laser light going from air into a semicircle plastic block as shown in figure 8. Alright. Using this one block, they vary the angle of incidence and measure the resulting angles of refraction. List the variables involved in this experiment and classify them, classify them as control, dependent or independent variables. Include one of each type of variable in the table provided below. All right. So, yeah, let's do this. So, basically, first, the first thing that comes to my mind is actually the angle of incidence is a variable. And it's basically the one that we're playing around with. We, we're varying it. We can control it, basically. So we can control it and, yeah, we, we are able to vary it. So that's going to be our independent variable, basically. Remember? When you have basically, um, let's say you're trying to measure something or you're doing an experiment, the thing that you can vary or yeah, pretty much, it's the pretty much your independent variable. The thing that you're trying to measure is your dependent variable, and it gets affected by your independent variable. So our angle of refraction got that right. So our angle of refraction is what we're trying to measure, basically. So when we're basically varying the angle of incidence, which is our independent variable, we're trying to measure the resulting angle. So the result. That's going to be your dependent variable. Beautiful. And so the last one is the control variable. So the control variable is the thing that you keep constant throughout the experiment. Basically looking at this, I think the thing that you need to basically keep constant is the frequency of light that you're pretty much using. Um, yeah, you don't want to affect that, basically. That's the first thing that comes to my mind. So I'm going to say the frequency of light. We want to keep that constant, basically. That's going to be our controlled variable. Beautiful. So Laura and Hal record the data shown in the table below. So we have the angle of incidence, so 510 degrees. We have the sine of the angles, and we have the uncertainty in the sine angles. And so we have the angle of refraction that's measured, and also the sine of the angles of refraction and the uncertainties. All right. Using the data in the table on page 22 on the axis below, plus sine r versus sine i, so your angle of refraction over your sine of uh, incidence, okay, um, draw in draw in uncertainty bars in both the x and y direction for each data point, draw a line of best fit, include labels and scales for both axes, so six marks, hmm, let's do that, so so I'm going to, of course, your, your, your angle of incidence, we said it was our independent variable, so if it's in our independent variable, it's going to be in our x um, axis, basically, it's going to be what our axis axis is so I'm gonna write sine ah what am I not sine i sorry angle of incidence and what your dependent variable is your refraction so sine r basically yep mm -hmm. so looking at this incidence a sign of incidence we can see that it's going by so the max is zero point four and the lowest is zero point zero nine so we'll go basically each so square by 0 0.05 is that that look good yeah 0 0.05 so so each so i'm gonna so this will be then 0 0.1 0 0.2 is that right just want to double check yes so 0 0.1 0 0.2 0 0.3 0 0.4 and 0 0.5 mm -hmm. and what about the other one the angle of refraction so it goes basically the same thing, but it's a little bit lower. So I'm just going to pretty much make it the same thing. So, so sign, it's basically 0 0.01, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and 
0 0.5. Done. So we've basically done that. We've added scales on both axes. And so now let's put, let's plot. So the first one is the sine 0 0.01 and your y value is going to be 0 0.05. So 0 0.09, which is approximately over here. So I'm going to draw this line around it. And then what's the other one? 0 0.052. So basically halfway through this. So it's going to be at this point here. So I'm going to rub this off. And yep, it's that point, that red point. The next one is 0 0.17. So 0 0.17. Mm, it's approximately here. And your value is 0 0.12. 0 0.12. So it's approximately here. So I'm going to make a nice circle and I'm going to rub that off. The next one uh, is 0 0.26. So 0 0.26 is approximately here. So 0 0.26 and your value, y value is 0 0.17. 0 0.17, so approximately here. Right there. Next thing is um, 0 0.34. It's approximately here. And your y value is 0 0.23, basically. So there we go. We are nearly done in doing those. So next one is 0 0.42. So 0 0.42 is approximately, so that's halfway, it's around there basically. And your, what's your y value? It's 0 0.28. So, um, so 0 0.5, 0 0.7, it's around here basically. That's it. And I'm going to rub those off. Done. So we've got those points. And now we're just going to put our uncertainty bars. And for both, it's 0 0.04. So both have the uncertainty is 0 0.04. So I'm going to... And what's that, basically? So 0 0.04 is... Because each square is 0 0.05. It's approximately... Um, that's 0 0.05, so it's a little bit less. Like that. So that's going to be there. It's basically like this. Yep. To that and all right and also the other way 0 0.05 so basically like this basically like this all right done and what i'm going to do basically because all of them have the same uncertainty bars i'm just going to copy this make my life easier basically i'm just going to duplicate this i'm going to put it on each like that duplicate that put it on this one too duplicate that Duplicate that and put it on that point. Oops. Approximately right there. Pretty much, yeah. Just right there. Done. So we've got that. And yeah, so now let's draw a best line of best fit. Now, I think the best fit is I know that when the angle is zero, your sine of incident, it's going to, and you put sine of zero, it's going to be zero. So I know it starts at zero, basically. We can have zero if you sub in sine of zero. So that works. So... It's going to give us, if I start, and which one will pass through most of these points? This part here. It passed through most of the points through basically this, this line here. So we can see that it's passing through that, 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 and that. Yeah, so that's the best line or best fit. And yes, that's it. Do we fit everything? So plot, draw uncertainty bars, draw a line. Yeah, that's it. From the graph created in Part B, determine the value of the refractive index of the plastic material of the block. Give your answer to an appropriate number of significant figures. All right, let's do that. So, we know basically that N1 sine, your angle of basically in this case is incident, is equal to your N2 sine, your angle of refraction. Now, N1's going to be 1 because remember it was in the air. Your N1's going to be 1. Your refractive index uh, is going to be 1. So, basically, we can take that out. Mm-hmm. And so basically N2, which is what we want to find, is your sine of your incidence over your sine of your refractive. How do we find that about? We can actually find it by the gradient of the sine. So we basically find the gradient of it. So let's pick two points. The points that come to me, it's this point here. Basically, this is a nice point. And also this point, that line perfectly. So 
I'm going to pick these two points. So it's basically the gradient of those are what? Basically like 0 0.2 minus 0 0.1 over, basically, uh, 0 0.2, yep. So 0 0.3 minus 0 0.15, basically. I'm going to write it nicely here. So um, your gradient, which is both, your gradient is your sine R over sine I. So your gradient, which is sine R over sine I, is basically what? 0 0.2 minus 0 0.1, 0 0.3 minus 0 0.15. That gives me 0 0.666. It's just a very big number, like 0 0.666. Now, think about it. We know that N2 is basically the refractive index of that passive material, and it's basically sine i over sine r. And we have our gradient, which is sine r over sine i, so we just have to basically flip it. So 1 over m is going to be equal to our N2, basically. Your gradient, 1 over our gradient is going to give us our N2. So our basically N2 is what? It's 1 over this, basically. What's 1 over that value? 1.5, basically. So our... Refractive index is 1.5. Done. Easy. That's it. That's a nice question, to be honest. That's good. Next question. Question 11. Let's have a look at this. Students are using a microwave set to study uh, wave interference. So the set consists of a microwave transmitter that can be set to produce microwaves of wavelengths 3 centimeters or 6 centimeters, a receiver that measures the intensity of the received signal and the wavelength. Okay. Plates that can be used to give a single or double slips of viewer's widths and separations, and a ruler. Take the speed of the microwave to be this. Calculate the frequency of the 3 centimeter microwaves. Easy. So if you want to calculate the frequency, we know that velocity is equal to your frequency times your wavelength. And so if we want to calculate our frequency, which is velocity over wavelength, our velocity is basically 3.0 times 10 to the power of 8, all being divided by our wavelength, which in this case is a 3 centimeter one. So 3 times 10 to the negative 2. Make sure of that. So what do we get? Times 10 to the power of 8, basically. Yep. Divided by 3 times 10 to the negative 2. That gives me, basically, a frequency of 1.0 times 10 to the power of 10. That's it. Beautiful. Next question. The students set up the equipment using a 3 centimeter microwaves, placing the receiver at X on the second nodal line. So when N equals 2, basically the second nodal where destructive interference happen, line minima, out from the center. Okay. Calculate the path difference. Show you're working out. Easy. So the path difference, if you're given it's the second nodal line, you just have to use... Okay, so we know the destructive... For path difference, for destruct, destructive interference is basically... N minus half times your wavelength, basically. And so if I know that it's a second, so N's two, half, and our wavelength is we're still using that three centimeter one. What's our wavelength? Basically three times 10 to the negative two, basically. Because we're using that three centimeter uh, wavelength. That's going to give me what? That's going to give me, we want in centimeters, so I'm going to times it by 100 to get in centimeters. That gives, gives me basically 4.5 centimeters. Easy. Nice. C. The student now replaces the two slits with a slit of width W as shown in figure 10. So this basically looks like a diffraction pattern just from looking at that. Uh, microtransmitter. So, okay, we've seen that this microtransmitter is creating those and the receiver. Okay. So with the transmitter set to a wavelength of three centimeters, the students measure the width of the diffraction pattern to be 20 centimeters at a particular distance from the slit as shown in figure 10. Then they switch it to a six centimeter wavelength on the transmitter. What effect will this have on the width of this pattern? Beautiful question. So what basically increasing your wavelength, what they've done is they've increased their wavelength. What effect does this have on the width of the diffraction pattern. Let's understand what really happened. So, so let's just do it in a diagram to kind of represent this. Like a nice, I want to explain it in such deep. So if you have, let's say something like this, actually, what I'm going to do is draw like this. Basically like that. And so now these are basically, say you have that. And basically now you have some waves coming. Some waves that have Basically, a short wavelength. Let's say these are three centimeters wavelength, basically. Let me just read that. 
right over here. They have a wavelength of that. So they say this is three centimeters. I'm just going to duplicate these now. Okay, now that these, you know, wavelengths, we can say that these wavelengths, which is here, is very small. And say it's um, basically uh, three centimeters. And they're passing through that diffraction pattern. So basically they're passing through this diffraction pattern. What's going to happen? Well, let's think. So we know that diffraction is proportional to what? It's wavelength over width. Now, we're not changing the width of the slit. We're just changing the... Um, what we're basically changing is the wavelength. So we can see that this wavelength is very small. And what happens if you have a small wavelength, you have a small diffraction, basically. Like, a, basically a small diffraction pattern. So what will happen is, basically, it will look like this. There will be, there'll be a little spread, basically. Basically, there will be a little spread. But how, what happens if you now... So now, so let's draw it nice a little bit. So there will be a little spread, basically. Like that. There'll be a little spread. So basically, if I look at this, that distance, they, we calculate it to be 20 centimeters. Now, imagine doing the same, but now we've doubled, basically. We have, we've basically doubled our wavelengths, basically, these wavelengths. Let's see what happens now from our formula. So let's take that. Take this like that. Okay, this is quite ugly, so I'm gonna first take these off a little bit. Okay, draw another ones. They are kind of spaced out basically. Like that. So now these are basically the wavelength is bigger. So it's like let's say it's double, it's that six centimeter. What really happens? Now you if you've doubled your wavelength, your diffraction pattern becomes more spread. So it will look like basically like this. Will become more spread basically now because you've basically you know if you have a bigger wavelength you'll, you'll become more spread and so basically your distance your width of basically your pattern of your width will be bigger compared to your smaller um wavelength views so yeah so just using this formula basically just because i wanted to show you kind of visually having a higher Wavelength means you have a big, much of a larger spread because the fraction is greater. And so there's more spread and so your width of your pattern will become bigger. And yeah, so we'll write that down now. All you need to basically, because it's two marks, just basically be very, yeah, write the formula. Let's see, so, so we can say that diffraction, let me actually zoom in, so, whoops, yep, so diffraction. Is, so proportional to wavelength over width basically so if the wavelength increases so if the wavelength increases diffraction increases Meaning, more spread which increases the width of the pattern, basically. That is it. That's a very nice basic question. Yeah, simple, nice, gets to the point, basically. And yeah, that's... Yeah, I hope that makes sense, how to do this question, and yeah. Question D. Well, the transmitted reset to a wavelength of 3 centimeters, the students place the receiver on a car. With the car stationary, the receiver measures the wavelength to be 3 centimeters exactly. The car is now set, moving away from the transmission, and shown in figure 11. Alright. Will this movement increase, decrease, or leave unchanged the wavelength as measured by the receiver on the car? Explain your answer, and name the physical principle involved now if you don't even realize what's happening this is the kind of the principle of doppler's effect we're gonna explain i'm gonna be very we're gonna try to because i think a lot of students don't understand what's happening because i'm not gonna explain it in a very nice uh, manner i want to try to basically draw you diagram and understand how to do it so this is basically an example of doppler's effect and we're gonna actually understand what happens to the wavelength as the car the, the wavelength that's going to be received when the car leaves it. So think of this. Think of the microtransmitter as what? Well. Let's draw a little kind of a diagram. So think of this microtransmitter as basically like a 
like it's making noise basically it's making noise like siren noise basically if you think of it like that so basically it's making some noise it's making you know basically some noise and so it's say the car's kind of close to it first initially the car is basically close to it let's draw that the car is close to it. So imagine you're the person and you're next to the siren. You can hear it high. You can like hear it very loudly. It means the frequency is large. Your frequency is basically large. So it, you, if you can hear it that loud. So the frequency is large. If frequency is large, remember frequency is um, inversely proportional to wavelength. It means your wavelength must be small. So basically what's happening is... The wavelength is very small, and that's why it's hitting your ears, so because the frequency is high. You can see those wavelengths are very, very small. But as you go further and further apart, so imagine this car goes, as it's going, blah, 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 it's going here. What's happening? As it lets it roll. Imagine you're the person in that car, and then, you you know, if you go further away from a siren, you won't hear it. It becomes less and less and less. It means that the f uh, basically the frequency becomes smaller. If frequency is small, it means our, what lay, uh, our wavelength must be high. So what does that tell us? So basically, it's telling me that the wavelength, as you're going further, the wavelength is getting larger and larger and larger and larger, basically. You see that those wavelengths, as further as the cut further goes to the right, the wavelength become larger and larger because the frequency is getting smaller and smaller. And so this is the, basically the definition of what Doppler's effect tells us. So easy. So... Will this movement increase or decrease? It will basically in, uh, increase our wavelength. And so what's the car going to measure? It's going to measure a bigger wavelength, basically. And yeah, so it's only two marks. So we're just going to basically say the wavelength. So the wavelength measured. So measured. Oops, so measured by... So the measure, but um, so the wavelength measured should be longer, not by so should be longer. This is an application, basically. This, but will this movement increase the wavelength? Will be increased. No, no, I'm gonna say increase, not longer. That sounds so. The wavelength of measured should be increased. Basically, should be increased. This basically is an application. So this, this is an application of Doppler's effect, basically. Doppler's effect. Easy. Well, that's it. Because you've just said that the, you've actually answered the wavelength should be increased. And you've also said this is the application of uh, Doppler's effect. Oh my god, application. I didn't even write the full thing. Wow. Yeah, I think that basically summarizes what this is. Easy. So, application. That's it. Done. I hope that makes sense and kind of gives you kind of in the next kind of basically detailing it. And yeah, let's just delete this part here. We don't need this anymore. Next part. Question 12. Figure 12 shows the energy level diagram for a hydrogen atom. All right, so we're given this. List the possible photon energies following emissions from N equals 4 state. Easy. So, if you're starting at N equals 4 and it's emitting, what are the possibilities that it can release? What emissions can it release? Well, it can release go down this way. That's a possibility. It can also go from this way. That's another possibility. And also it can go this way. Now, there's another possibility that it can go basically this way to down. Down. Um, also, another possibility that it can go this way. And also, another last possibility, I believe, is basically this way. So, there's six possibilities that a f basically an emissions from N equals 4 state can basically go. So, yeah. Let's just basically write those um, energies. So, easy. So, the first one is N equals 4 to N equals 1, which is basically a 12.8 electrovolts. Next one is basically 12.8. Let me write this 12.8. 12.8 minus. So this one here minus that. It's 12.8 minus 10.2. That's 2.6 volts. 2.6 electrovolts. Next one is 12.8 minus 12.1. So basically this one to that one. So that's 0 0.7 electrovolts. This one, this one's the next one, so uh, 
basically it's just 12.1 and the next one is 12.1 minus 10.2 1.9 electrovolts and the last one is basically 10.2 electrovolts so yeah there's only six possibilities basically that they can emit from n equals four state. Easy. One of the most kind of common questions that you'll see in an exam. It's so easy to get full marks for this. Next question. Um, question 13. Electrons are accelerated through a potential difference of 400 volts and then pass through a metallic crystal. The resulting diffraction pattern is observed. Calculate the de Bregoli wavelength of these electrons. Easy. So, if we're given the voltage, we can actually calculate the kinetic energy from that. Because we know that kinetic energy is what? It's your charge times your voltage, basically. So, it's a. It's basically what do we call it? Um, what am I saying? It's basically an electron. So the charge is one point six times ten to the negative nineteen, and the voltage is four thousand volts. This will produce how much kinetic energy? This will produce basically six point four times ten to the negative sixteen. Um, joules of energy. And so, if we have our kinetic energy, we know from this formula, looking at my summary sheet, so momentum, if we can find momentum, so momentum is just basically the square root of 2 times the mass, so 2 times the mass times your kinetic energy of the electron. So, that's going to be basically, oh, it's all right, so that's going to be 2. The mass of an electron is 9.1 times 10 to the negative 31. And so the kinetic energy is 6.4 times 10 to the negative 16. And that's going to give me what? So square root of 2 times uh, 9.1 times 10 to the negative 31 times the answer. We get basically a momentum of 3.4. I'm going to write the whole thing to 129, basically times 10 to the negative 23 kilograms meters per second. So that's our momentum. And now we have our momentum, we can easily calculate our de Broglie wavelength because we know our wavelength is basically H over your momentum. Uh, is that right? Yes. So, yep. So that's going to be what? Your H, because we want it in, oh, one nanometers, make sure it's basically 6.63 times 10 to the negative uh negative 34 just looking at my summary sheet is that the right value yep and so your momentum overall let's write that down so 3.4129 times 10 to the power of negative 23 so that's going to give me what 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34 the answer and so i've got the actual um wavelength but it's in meters but we want it in nanometers so i'm going to times it by 10 to the power of 9 to get in it is so that gives me basically what so it gives me one point so 1.9 basically times 10 to the power of so one two to the negative two basically easy b a student jane says that x-rays of a suitable wavelength could produce the same diffraction pattern absolutely she's correct having the same wavelength if you have an electron the Bregoli wavelength of an electron to be the same as the x-ray they'll both produce the same diffraction pattern similar Calculate the energy of the X-ray beam required to give a similarly spaced diffraction pattern to the electrons. Easy. So, for them to have basically the same um, X-ray and diffraction pattern, they need to have the same wavelength. So, the wavelength that we would have calculated, I want to calculate in meters. So, that wavelength, I'm going to first times 10 to the power of negative 9 to bring it back to where it was. So, it was 1.9423. Times 10 to the power of negative 11 meters. Is that right? Did I convert it properly? I want to double check that. Um, so, but the... Mm -hmm. mm -mm -mm. Times 10 to the power... Yes, that looks good. Yep, I got that in wavelength. And so if I wanted to have the same energy, I'm looking at my summary. So the energy of a photon on x-ray is basically... HC over... Your wavelength so we know h uh, we want electrovolts so h has to be basically 4.14 times 10 to the power of negative 15 basically 
your C is basically 3.0 times 10 to the power 8, the speed of light, all divided by the wavelength that we've given here. 1.9426 times 10 to the power of negative 11. So, that's going to give me 4.14 times 10 to the negative 15, 3.0 times 10 to the power of 8. Put the answer down, and I get basically 6.4 times 10 to the power of 1, 2, 3, 4, to the power of 4 electrovolts. Easy. Beautiful. Explain how electrons and x-rays can uh, exhibit similar diffraction patterns. What a beautiful, easy question. Now, why do they basically have the same diffraction patterns? It's because basically the electrons de Bregoli wavelength must be the same as the x-rays. Because remember, diffraction, what we said, diffraction depends on the width and the uh, wavelength. So if their wavelengths are both the same, they're going to be basically producing the same diffraction pattern. And this was actually proven when they, they basically, I think they took electrons and they hit it on crystal. Basically in a crystal, if you look at this, so what they did was they took like that. And so imagine, and they took another one basically. So imagine this is your diffraction pattern. It's not the best diffraction pattern. They basically, they saw that this here, your wavelength, it would, was the same if you had the same wavelength, basically, you would have the same um, wavelength for an electron. You would basically have the similar, um, basically, for an X-ray. Easy. So that's why they kind of prove that. So, yeah, it depends on the wavelength. If the wavelength is the same, the de Broglie wavelength of an electron is the same as the wavelength of the X-ray, they would both have this basically similar um, diffraction pattern. So that's how they proved it. Um, yeah, let's write that down. So, for diffraction pattern to be similar Oops. electrons de Broglie wavelength so do you want to write de Broglie Broglie wavelength mm -hmm. so de Broglie wavelength uh, must be the same, so it must be the same as the x-rays, so as the x-rays wavelength. As we know, because diffraction is dependent on wavelength. Beautiful. That's that's it. I mean, that yeah, goes those two marks. You've said that for them to be the same, they have to have the same wavelength. And because wavelength is basically, um, you know, dependent on the uh, diffraction. So diffraction is dependent on wavelength, basically. Beautiful. Question 14. An Earth-like planet has been discovered orbiting a distant star. A hypothetical, a hypothetical mission to this planet is suggested. The planet is 1.08 times 10 to the power of meters from the Earth. So let's just draw a diagram to understand this. So imagine you had basically, say this planet, and say you had the Earth, basically here. So basically, the distance measured from the Earth to the planet, from the Earth, sorry, from the Earth's perspective, so people who are measuring from the Earth have measured it to be basically 1.0 times 10 to the power of 18 meters, basically. The spaceship that's suggested for this mission can travel at an average speed of this, take gamma as to be this. So imagine we had a spaceship, I'm going to draw as a box, basically. And so, let's write it nicely like that. Imagine it's traveling, basically, to, the, to that planet at that basic velocity. 0.99c. Easy. So it's traveling there. Um... Scientists are concerned about the length of time that the passengers would have to spend on the spaceship to travel to this planet. Use, principle, use principles of special relativity to estimate the time in years measured on this spaceship. All right. So whenever I get a question, I like to draw a diagram and I like to kind of now know which one's having left contraction one, and which one's having time dilation. To know this is imagine you're the person that's in the spacecraft, basically. You're in the spacecraft and so imagine you're going at such high velocities. You know, like when you watch like, you know, Star Star Wars and, you know, uh, you know Star Trek and you see how, imagine you're going at like the speed of light, you'll see them how quickly, it looks like it's shrinking. 
basically. What they will see, these people, what they will see, the people in um, the space, what they'll see is that this length here, the length that it takes basically to this length here, to be contracted, it look like it's they're going at such high speed. It's they look it look like it's they're close to it basically. Yeah. So the length that these people are going to be measuring are the length contraction basically. So L. So if they're measuring the length contraction, then the people here on the planet of um, Earth must be measuring the proper length, basically. So and now it's easy to know because if these people are measuring proper length, they must be measuring time dilation, and so these people here must be. Measuring, uh, basically, what am I, uh, proper time. So the people on the spacecraft must be basically measuring proper time. Easy. Now, oops, what do I do? Now I know everything what's happened. That's all I need. So I've kind of broken it down. So that's it. So now what I'm going to do is, what I want to do is basically measure the time, the time uh, measured on the spaceship. So these people on the spaceship are going to basically be measuring the proper time. So what we want to do is calculate the proper time. So put this down here. All right. All right. So right there. that's going to help us. Now, what do we know? We know that proper, so we know that time, so time is proper time. So time dilation is proper time times your uh, Lorentz factor. So your proper time, which we want to calculate now, is time over your proper, your time dilated over your um, basically gamma or your Lorentz factor. So how do we calculate that? So we first need to calculate that time dilated. What's the time that's dilated? Now that's easy because why? If we know it's, so the time that's going to be dilated is the basically what the scientists on the earth are measuring. We know the time, we know the length that they are already measuring and we know that the speed at which they are measuring. By the way, this speed, remember the speed, um, the, the second postulate. So Einstein's second postulate states that um, the speed of light is the same for all observers. Basically, the people here are going to be still measuring that same speed and the people here that are on Earth basically are going to be measuring the same speed. So it doesn't even matter. Speed's going to be the same for any of them. So we already know the speed the scientists are measuring, and we already know the, the, the length that the scientists on people um, on the Earth are measuring. So doing that, basically, uh, we can easily calculate the proper, uh, the length contracted, because that's what they're measuring. So basically, time is basically for them, is just distance, uh, it, which is not, which is proper length, basically, in this case, over your... Um, uh, velocity basically easy so it's distance over velocity basically and that's so yeah that's going to give us our time dilated so our length is going to be what they're measuring the scientist or the earth is measuring 1.0 times 10 to the power of 18 over your velocity which is 0 0.99 times 3.0 times 10 to the power of 8 done so that's going to give me my time that's been dilated. So that, oh, it's a big number, so I'm going to write it just 3.36, 7 times 10 to the power of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So basically 9 seconds. That's the time that's been dilated. So now that's going to be easy because we now we have, now it's easy to calculate our proper time. So proper time is our time dilated which we just calculated, basically, which is 3.367 times 10 to the power of 9, all being divided by your gamma, which is 7.1. That divided by 7.1, and we get basically our proper time, which is a very, very big number. So it's 4.7 times 10 to the power of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Wait, is it? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8... I just want one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it's eight to the power of eight seconds, basically. So that's the proper time. And now we just need to calculate in years. If that's in seconds, all we got to do is basically divide it by 60. So that we've got it in minutes. Divide it by another 60 to get it now in hours. And now if we divide it by another, by 24, we get it in days. And we divide it by 365. Now we get it in years, which is basically 15 years. Easy. That's not bad. Three marks. Wow. Question 15. Um, an unstable subatomic particle known as a meson decays completely into electromagnetic radiation. The rest mass of this meson is that. How much energy would be released by this meson if it decays at rest? Very nice and easy. So we know rest energy, if you want to calculate the rest energy, is just mc squared. 
So, what's the mass of this meson? It's 2.5 times 10 to the power of negative 28, 3.0 times 10 to the power of 8, your speed of light squared. Easy. Times 10 to the negative 28, 3.0 times 10 to the power of 8 squared. So that's going to give me, I want to double check if everything's right. Have I not made any mistakes? Do, do, do. So 3.0 times 10 to the negative 8 squared. Beautiful. So that gives me to two significance 2.3 times 10 to the power of negative 11 joules of energy. Beautiful. Question 16. Yes, photoelectrical effect. Students are investigating the photoelectrical effect. The, apparat the apparatus used by the students is shown in figure 13. A light source shines a uh, light through a filter that only allows one frequency of light to pass through. The mono this monochromatic light shines onto a metal plate and only allows one frequency of light to pass through. This monochrom monochromatic light shines into the metal plate and the photoelectrons are emitted. Different filters allow different frequencies to strike the metal plate. For each frequency, the maximum kinetic energy of the emitted photo photoelectrons is measured by using the stopping voltage. Beautiful. The graph of this data that the student collected for the maximum kinetic energy of the emitted photoelectrons versus the frequency shown is shown in figure 14. A line of best fit has been drawn. Beautiful. Question A, determine the value of Planck's constant h that the student would have obtained from this graph. So it's measured in electro volts per second. Easy. Remember, so if you're given basically a EK max versus frequency, it's just basically your Planck's constant is the, um, your gradient of the line. So pick any two points. So basically just e any two points that make your life easier. So I'll, I'll pick this one over here. I'll draw another class so you can see it. So this point here. And I will pick maybe this point here. This looks nice. So basically... My gradient, which is my gradient, which is basically, let me write it as h, because it's Planck's constant, basically h, or Planck's constant is basically 2 minus 0, so 2 minus 0 over, um, basically 6 minus, so 6, 6 minus 2, times 10 to the power of 14. That's going to give me my Planck's constant. 2, 6 minus 2, 4 times 10 to the power of 14. Basically, it gives me 5.0 times 10 to the power of negative 15 electrovolts. Beautiful. Easy. That's your Planck's constant. Uh, B, determine the values of the minimum frequency of the or the cutoff frequency that the students would have obtained from this graph. Beautiful. It's just where basically where it crosses the frequency axis or this basically x-axis, which is 2 times 10 to the power of 14. Easy. So that's right. It's only one mark. So 2.0 times 10 to the power of 14. Is that right? Yep. Part 14. Next question. C, determine the value of the work function of the middle in the plate that the students would have obtained from this graph. Remember, your work function is basically where it crosses the y-axis, which is basically negative 1. But make sure it's make a positive, never negative, because remember, it's energy. Energy is not negative. So, 1 electrovolt, basically. Oopsies. 1 electrovolt. D. The student replaced the photo cell for one that has different metal plate with a work function of 2.5. Draw in the graph they with their, 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 wait they would now expect. So basically, if they have a different work structure, the, um, your Planck's constant is going to be constant. So all what's going to happen is, let me draw this line. So I'm going to basically draw the same line on this same gradient, basically, because it's the same Planck's constant. But what I'm going to do is basically shift this one down to that negative 2.5, which occurs over here, basically. Done. Easy. That's how the graph would look like. Is that Was that it? The same? draw a graph that they would expect yes so 2.5 electrovolts that's the work function yep so that's here's 2.5 and yeah same gradient basically easy uh question 17 let's have a look at it the results of the photoelectrical effect experiment provides evidence for the particle like nature of light true alan one aspect of the results that that would provide this evidence your response should explain why a wave model of light cannot satisfactorily explain this aspect of the results and how the photon theory does explain this aspect on of the result what a beautiful question this question has come up in so many of these exams that you should have it in your summary sheet so i have these points on my summary sheet and i'm going to read them out now the you know in your photoelectrical effects there's actually three things that basically um it can explain the wave model basically can explain 
why, you know, it, why is that? So basically what the wave model um, predicts wrong is that there's a time delay. So the wave model be believes that there's actually time delay happening. There should be like a time delay um, happening, but measuring the, in the photo, basically in the photoelectric effect, but that's not true because they found that there's no time delay. So I'm just going to basically, there's only three things that the wave model basically predicts that's wrong. And it cannot actually satisfactorily explain why. So time delay, any frequency of light should produce a photocurrent, or the maximum kinetic energy of the emitted photoelectrons depends on the intensity of light. Basically, these are the things I've written in my summary sheet, and these are basically the three that you only need to know. So whenever you're in these questions, you basically, these are the points that you want to talk about. So, but it only says it outlined one aspect. So I'm only going to talk about one aspect, and my, one of my favorite is basically time delay. So I want to explain why the wave model predicts it wrong, and how the photon model basically will predict you know, how would it, how would basically would explain it. So let's explain. So basically the wave model um, predicts that there should be a time delay. And we're going to explain how. So, so basically the wave model basically states that it waves, so waves like that, are made out of energy. So imagine this wave carries energy basically. And say we have an electron. So we have an electron here. And this electron, for it to be released, it needs energy Basically, it needs energy more than the work function. So it needs energy that's more than the work function for it to be released. So imagine that this, basically this, it carries energy. And so, you know, this thing carries energy. And so it's basically going to um, the electron. So the thing about the wave model, it explains that when basically these waves are hitting this electron, what's happening is it predicts that there should be a time delay because imagine, you know, these waves are basically giving it little energy, little energy by little energy. So imagine it's giving it little energy by little energy. So imagine this is your work function, basically. Let me explain it like this. Imagine this is your work function. And so imagine one wave hits it, you know, it, it gets, it gets, it absorbs some of the energy, but you know, it hasn't got more than the uh, work function, energy more than the work function. So it cannot be released. And basically more of these waves are hitting it. So there's more, it's adding, adding up until it goes above the work function, it will be released. So they believe that there should be a time delay here. There should be like a time delay where basically the electrons basically like, you know, uh, absorbing enough energy to be emitted. But yeah, when they did the photoelectrical effect, that wasn't true. They, they didn't even see no time delay. There was no time delay. So, and that's why the wave model basically fails to predict that. So, but what really kind of explains that is the photon theory. So the photon theory was actually created by Einstein. And what he said was, okay, think of basically photons. Let's call this a photon. I'm going to call it like, imagine a photon is going basically the same. So we have an electron here. So if that's, imagine this is, let me write it as P. Imagine this photon, basically. What photons are is, think of it like this. So, Basically, when a, pho a photon carries a photon, basically carries energy. So this photon also carries energy, and so it's carrying this energy. And so when it collides with an electron, basically, this is what uh, the photon theory states. So when a photon collides with an electron, it instantly absorbs the energy. The, the electron instantly absorbs all the energy, basically. That's what it is. So there's no time like there's. It's not like the uh, wave theory where you know there's some time difference or you know it absorbs it over time. No. It will instantly, you know, absorb that energy. That's what the photon theory states. So imagine this photon. Basically, let's say it's carrying, let's say we got a work function, let's say of two. I'm making up this rubbish up, but two electric volts. So, and so basically, let's say this carries, you know, um, 1.5 electric volts. Basically, what it states is each photon will hit one electron. Each, so it, one photon will hit one electron. And what it will do is it will pass all its energy to the electron. So the electron will absorb all the energy of the photon. So imagine this thing collides with the electron and basically the electron gains a 1.5 electric volt um, of um, you know, energy. But that's wrong because it hasn't got enough energy to be basically going above that um, work function. So it won't even be released, basically. That's why. But if you gave energy, if a photon carries more energy, carries an energy, let's say, basically an energy greater than the work function, then when it collides with an electron, an electron will be basically emitted. So that's what the photon theory basically explains. So if a photon does not have enough energy, then the electron won't be emitted. But if it does, or a sufficient energy, then basically the electron will be emitted. And so that's what the photon basically theory 
states. So don't get it confused. Basically, what it says is when a photon is absorbed by an electron, all of the photon's energy is absorbed instantly. So there's no time delay rather than being absorbed over time like a wave. That's what it is. And that's what we're going to basically explain. These are all the points that you kind of want to basically put in like a paragraph. I'm not going to write it like a sample one that I have in my summary sheet, basically. Because these questions always repeat. So have these in your summary sheet. So I'm going to write time delay only. Of course, let's go. So time delay. Let's have a look at my summary sheet. Time delay. I'm going to be explained. So it says the wave model... predicts that when a wave that when a wave hits an electron its energy would be absorbed basically Now, by the way, I'm writing a, I'm going to write a big paragraph that pretty much describes all this step that I talked about. But make sure in your exam, make sure you don't point it. Just don't point it. Don't write this much that I'm doing. I'm just trying to, so you can guys can basically put this in the summary sheet. So when you're in an exam, um, you're kind of confused or something, you can read it and you straight away get, a, like, get an idea of what to write. So this is a very, yeah, hopefully this kind of explains everything. So, so basically until the electron has enough energy to escape the metal plate at time delay would be observed over time basically it takes an electron so it takes an electron to absorb enough energy to be released so yep enough energy to be released so but the wave model basically failed to answer that. So basically it fails to answer that as there is no time delay when doing the photoelectrical effect, when doing the photoelectrical effect. Beautiful. So we've stated that. And now, so that's basically answering basically this here. So that should give you three marks, basically. It's very detailed. And now the per the second part comes is how the photon theory does explain this aspect. And that's what we're going to write about. So basically the photon theory. So uh, I'm going to write photon theory here. So photon theory. Dot, dot. So when, basically what we said. So when a photon... Is absorbed by an electron. All why is it so <laughs> electron? All of the photons energy is absorbed. Um, we said absorbed instantly. In Instantly, rather than being absorbed over time like a wave, over time like a wave. If the photon, so photon has sufficient energy then the electron then the electron will be emitted 
If not, then the electron will not be emitted. Then the electron will not be emitted. Will not be emitted. This is one of the most detailed kind of answers you could give. Basically, yeah, it kind of just explains all the aspects. And yeah, that should be like a six marker, six marker, basically. And yes, now we are up to the last question. Question 18. Explain how a diffraction pattern is produced by a stream of electrons passing through um, a narrow sleeve can illustrate Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. All right, let's do this. So, by the way, this is not anymore in our study design. Uh, Heisenberg's uncertainty has been taken off. This wasn't the old study design. So you guys who are basically in 2024 and greater, they've took Heisenberg's uncertainty, but I'm still going to go in detail what it is, basically. And yeah, what is Heisenberg's uncertainty? Let's actually explain this. The best way to explain this is by drawing a diagram. So, and this is the way that actually explains um, basically diffraction, how diffraction actually occurs. Now, Heisenberg's, but basically Heisenberg's uncertainty formula is this basically. So it's the change in position y times change in position or momentum in the y direction, sorry, is going to be greater or equal to h over 4 pi. So h over 4 pi is basically a constant. So I'm just going to write it as 1. It's just a basic constant. I'm, greater or equal, I'm just going to write it as equal basically to explain this. So what this is telling me is these are this means uncertainty in the um, y position and this means uncertainty in the momentum in that y direction. So let me explain what this means. If you have a, this is great, it means your uncertainty in the y direction is high, it means, if this is high, it means you have basically a low uncertainty in the momentum in the y direction. But, say we have, we, you know, have uncert a low uncertainty in the y direction. It means we have a high uncertainty in the momentum position, because remember, they all must equate to one. This is just like an example to really explain what it is. So let's just draw a diagram of why it works like that. So basically imagine you have a slit here. Basically you have a slit. So you have exactly like a nice slit here. And so say these electrons are going to be going to the right. So you have electrons basically are going to the right. So I'm going to duplicate these electrons going to the right. Like this. So these electrons are basically going to the right. And so imagine um, also we have like a wall that's behind it, like a little wall. Okay, so we have a wall, nice wall there. And so basically I'm going to just draw basically something like this and basically something like this. All right. And let's understand what's happening like that. All right. So remember this is our width here. This is our width of our um, slit. So, I'm just going to also draw like a thing to represent the direction. So, remember, this is your x component. This is your x and this is your y. Let's explain what Heisenberg's uncertainty really works like. So, what it is, is these electrons, these over here, are actually moving to the right. Now, we cannot measure the exact position of each electron and its exact momentum as it approaches the slit. It means they can hit here, hit here, hit here, hit here. They can be anywhere. They, like, we cannot actually exactly measure um, the exact position. So, what does that mean? We both have a high uncertainty in both the position and the high, basically, uncertainty in the momentum, basically. That's what it is. But when you put a split, uh, when you actually put a slit, like, for example, this slit here, what have you done? You have basically reduced the uncertainty in the y position. For example, this is basically in that y direction, as you say. So what you've done is you've decreased because we know that we are certain that some are going to pass here. So we've, what we've done is we've basically decreased the uncertainty in the uh, y direction, basically. This here. How do you decrease it in that y direction? Yep. What would this do? Well, it will have a big... So remember, it must they all must be like equal to that constant. So what would happen is basically the momentum, the uncertainty in the momentum in the y direction would increase gradually if that, you know, happened. So that's what's happening right now. So because the momentums in that y direction, in that y direction increases, that tells us why that electrons, electrons basically hit, basically points over here. That's why they kind of, they hit any point basically, like they hit, um, so let me explain. So the uncertainty in the momentum's y direction means that each electron could follow a path anywhere. So in this cone, it could follow, it could follow maybe this path here, this path here, it could follow basically any path in that cone diagram. And so over time, when these basically electrons are hitting, there would be a basically a diffraction pattern happening. And so that's why, actually, 
Heisenberg's uncertainty explains this a little bit in a more nicer way. Um, it's not a, it's not anymore in the you know study design, so you don't have to worry about it. But yeah, so yeah, if you because what we've done is we've decreased the uncertainty in that y direction, there must be an increase in the momentum in that y direction. So that's why they hit kind of anywhere basically. And so over time there will be a, a diffraction pattern. So let's write basically summarize that in basically a nice kind of answer. So we know the diffraction basically the diffraction pattern. Of electrons when passing through a single slit, so through a single slit, can be explained, be can be explained by Heisenberg's. So Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, blah, 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 principle. So as a decrease, you said as a decrease in position, uncertainty due to the slit, Which means, basically, which means, which means, basically, so, which basically, uh, not which means, but which increases, so, which increases momentum uncertainty, basically. After many electrons have traveled through, This range of possible momentums of possible momentums momentums create a diffraction pattern basically. A diffraction pattern. And that is it basically. That's just basically Heisenberg's uncertainty and how it explains how a diffraction basically is produced through a stream of electrons passing through a narrow slit. Yeah, I mean, not anymore in the study zone, so you don't actually have to learn this. So take that off of your brain. You don't even need to know this, but this is just for, um, basically, yeah, I just wanted to complete this whole exam with the knowledge that I still have from Heisenberg's uncertainty. I hope this, you know, video helped you understand, basically, you know, helped you in a way. Um, please make sure to like and subscribe and follow for more videos. It will be a great pleasure, um, you know, trying to make more videos in the future. And yeah, guys, I hope you have a great day and make sure you take care of yourself. Bye-bye.